So welcome to this introduction to Mahara. Um, I'm Christina Hoppner from Catalyst IT and the Mahara project lead um, now already for a number of years. And I'm really happy to show you around a few things why people might be using portfolios. Catalyst IT, the company that I work for, is the maintainer of Mahara and has been the main development company and also the maintainer of the software since its inception in 2006, when the project was founded by a number of uh, New Zealand universities. We do have offices in a number of locations now around the world. Um, the first one was uh, founded in Wellington in 1997. And we branched out to also Auckland and Christchurch here in the country, as well as Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane in Australia, Brighton and Dublin in Europe. And our very latest office is now in Canada. And it's fantastic to be spreading the e-learning work that we've started here in Aotearoa around the world, but also work with clients on more bespoke solutions. So we do all things uh, open source and Mahara is one of the projects that we offer to our clients, as well as in this case also support the wider community and actively develop on the software. So Mahara now is already 15 years old or young, depending on how you look at it. And uh, it was founded in 2006 as a project by a number of universities here in New Zealand and other tertiaries, as I've already mentioned, because at that time, the academics and researchers found that just having a learning management system is not quite enough. They wanted to give students a possibility to also store their learning evidence for themselves and create something like a personal learning environment, which allowed them to decide what was important for their learning journey. So that's when the development started. And since then we've gradually added features to it, to change things around and now support organizations around the world. And many also host their own Mahara site themselves. So there are a number of support companies that can assist, but it is also fine if you just want to host it on your own server or even just install it on, on your computer if you want to develop on it. Now, what, you can, what can you actually use portfolios for? There are lots of different types of portfolios and reasons why you would create a portfolio. So I'm going to um, mention a number of them, but that is definitely not an exhaustive list. So in the center of Mahara um, is our learner. And that learner really has to control over pretty much everything in their portfolio because it is a nice contrast to the learning management system where the learner can um, participate in activities that a teacher gave them, but they don't really oftentimes have the control over um, whether they want to upload a file or participate in a forum post or create a glossary entry. They are being told more or less often, often um, what they have to do, whether there is a form or a file upload, glossary, workshop and the like. Whereas in Mahara, when a learner goes in, it is their workspace and they can decide. However, of course, also, we, we also have to recognize that a lot of portfolios these days are created for assessment or evaluation purposes and also for certification or recertification purposes in professions. So there can also be quite a formal element to portfolios that is a possibility where there's more structure and where students might need to follow a particular template. So let's take a look at some possibilities of how portfolios could be used. So one is for learning. The learning portfolio is the typical portfolio that you would see when you want to, um, when you want to follow the learning progress of somebody and they 
show what they had done in the past, where they are now, and maybe also where they want to go in the future. And this portfolio is often very, very reflective. The other portfolio that is well known is the assessment portfolio. And that is often tied to a particular course that can also be set, on in, set up in the LMS follows the structure and requires students to create to demonstrate particular elements in their portfolio. The reflective element though also plays a big role in here. Another portfolio that we are seeing increasingly is one that is created in the context of work integrated learning, will. Because when students are on internship or externships or work placement, whatever it may be called, be called in your context, the um, tertiary institution might often like to stay in touch with them while they are away for a semester or even longer. The portfolio gives them that possibility because students can journal while they are at um, work, working at a company and reflect on their experiences and their lecturer can then reply and leave comments, uh, support the student from afar and um, give them that necessary support structure or encouragement for the internship that they might need. The other possibility, of course, that students also have, especially also for the work integrated learning portfolio, is that they can share media artifacts like videos or photos that they have taken and put all of that into their portfolio that they can then make accessible to their instructor or also to their internship supervisor if they like. One very well known type of portfolio is the showcase portfolio or presentation portfolio. That one as it already says, showcases what a learner has done. It typically contains the very good stuff, um, but that doesn't preclude it from also containing reflections or showing the progression that a learner has gone through uh, over the course of their learning journey. Increasingly, we also see that portfolios are being used in professions. Um, teaching, of course, has already had a very long uh, history of using portfolios, um, well established already as paper based portfolios. This, um, they go back all the way to the 1970s. And nursing has also had a very long portfolio tradition since the early 80s. And now more and more organizations have moved to keeping an electronic record because of course a lot of the evidence that is being taken is not necessarily handwritten anymore but is already available as a digital artifact therefore making it easy to put it into a digital portfolio. The professional certification portfolios um, in the way that I've encountered them over the last years they are very um, very structured. They are often based on a template so that busy professionals do not have to think about how to structure the portfolio, what needs to go in there, um, what instructions they need to follow, but all of that can be preset made available to them so that they can go into their portfolio. You can also have it automatically populated into their account. And then they, when they see the portfolio, they can have instructions immediately there, fill in their portfolio, yet also still be able to customize it if they want to do so. We could fiddle out those different types of portfolios even more in subtypes if we wanted to, but I think having these five available is already sufficient for our further thinking and introducing what you can do with portfolios and or what you can do in Mahara with portfolios. Now, while there are these distinct types of portfolios, they rarely exist in their singular form, but there is always some sort of overlap because 
the learning portfolio, assessment portfolio, work integrated learning portfolio, showcase portfolio and professional certification portfolio often do keep some sort of reflection and should have a reflection because that is where we see the learning progression. Then also a learning port or um, evidence that you have in a learning portfolio might even be repurposed in an assessment portfolio or in a showcase portfolio. Because the nice thing about a digital portfolio is you do not have to make physical copies. Once you have a file uploaded to the platform, you can use it in multiple portfolios. The same thing, of course, also goes for journal entry. Once you've written a journal entry, it can go into many different portfolios and you display the con and because you display the content in context, it can take on a different meaning or it can come from a different perspective and show some other part of your learning or you might categorize things differently and therefore provide a different entry point for others to find out about you. And therefore, there is always a bit of overlap um, and it is entirely up to your organization to see which portfolio type might be the predominant one. So some organizations really focus on one particular type, whereas other organizations, especially in the higher education tertiary area, can have multiple diff multiple portfolios and uh, support different types. Mahara itself supports all of these types of portfolios because it is a really flexible portfolio platform that doesn't prescribe a certain path and only allows you to create one or the other sort of portfolio but you can decide what portfolio you want to create and can have many, many different ones in your account. Now, before we go a little bit more into the theory, um, I would like to introduce a few examples to you and showcase them to you. If you like to view the life sites of these portfolios, you're very welcome to click into the shared notes in Big Blue button, um, right above where the names are listed, where you can find the links to all of these examples. Let's start with a portfolio from Teresa McKinnon from Warwick University, now um, happily retired uh, researcher and lecturer. Um, here is a portfolio that she created for her CMALT review. CMALT is the certified member of the Association of Learning Technologists, and they require a portfolio of all their professionals. It is on purpose that you can't read the entire text. I'll just call out some words and phrases in here that really showcase the language that uh, can be used on portfo in portfolios and that demonstrate that Teresa is not just giving us a summary of what she had done throughout her entire career, but where she specifically thinks about the audience of the portfolio and the purpose of the portfolio. So one important thing for her is that, or one important thing in the portfolios is that you're, that you're not giving everybody everything. And so not every single piece of evidence should go in a portfolio because that can be overwhelming. And a viewer might not really see what you actually want to tell them. So what Teresa says here in her text is a highlight of my professional career. So she showcases one, so she uses one particular moment that was very crucial to her and talks about that in her portfolio because that demonstrates most clearly what she wants to get across. Furthermore, she says, the point at which I realized Again, she doesn't give us everything about her things, but the, the one important thing that made her think, made her think back, made her think forward, and that was pivotal for her career. She also revisited things. So she looked back at what she had done 
reflected on her activities, reflected on her previous original CMALT certification and learned from that, incorporating that into her current practice. But because learning is not happening in a vacuum, uh, she also incorporates feedback and mentoring because that was helpful to her to think back at what she had done in the past and see what she wants to keep and what she wants to take forward and maybe change. So all of these callouts that you can see here on the page are typical of good portfolio work because they demonstrate that we make a selection, that there is reflection going on, and also that we are engaging with others. Now let's turn to some student portfolios. And again, you'll find the link to it in the shared notes. This is an example from Brianna Edibles at Monash University that she put together for her media studies. The portfolio follows a very simple structure. It is not based on a template. So Priyana decided how she wants to represent herself. And you can see that she chose to use a skin to personalize the platform and to really show who she is, um, what is important to her. And then she talks about the project that um, she, or the task that she was given and includes a reflection. Another example, this time from Dublin City University, is from Karasina, uh, Johanna Mruschik, who created a portfolio for the mentorship program that she participated in. Her portfolio looks to be based on a template um, because when you scroll further down on the page, on the real page, you will see that there are some instructions included. But it also means that the instructions are not overpowering because there's only one um, set of instructions left. Everything else is very much her own. And you can also see that she used a skin because she created this uh, specific header and also had the underlines for the blocks in a matching color. Karasina's portfolio is also a wonderful example about um, of reflecting, talking about her experience and what she has learned from it. And the last example that I want to share with you is this one here from Mark Brady, also a student at Dublin City University, who created a portfolio for a course on critical thinking, collaboration and enterprise. Mark's portfolio is very creative and very visual, as you can see from all the graphics that are on this page alone and also the videos that he has shared. Some of the graphics on the actual website are also moving, making it even more interesting. He also reflects very well in his portfolio and ties his learning experiences in reflecting on them. One very cool thing about Mark's portfolio is uh, that he doesn't seem to have that top page title because all you see is his picture and then this huge, um, huge text. So what he has cleverly done is created a skin in Mahara that chooses the color white as background for the page title so that it blends in with the background of the page itself, therefore becomes invisible to people who can see and look at his portfolio, and then styles it more like a um, website. There are a number of other examples that you can explore, and you're very welcome to also go through these in more detail if you like. These are just a small selection of portfolios that hopefully give you a bit of an idea of what you can do with them. And hopefully what you have heard throughout, the, throughout me going through the portfolios is that 
They talk about learning experiences and also incorporate reflection. So what does that mean for us in portfolio practice? Well, in a way, I think it all comes down to the to the concept of folio thinking that Helen Chen at Stanford University pioneered and here represented through a quote by uh, from Vicky Suter's blog. So folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely i.e. tell stories about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. So the highlights that I made here in this definition should help us kind of pick out the, the Im more important and summarizing bits, namely that a portfolio is a collection, organization, reflection, and connection through which we are telling our stories. So essentially, we are always telling our learning story, our learning journey, make our learning journey visible. And by create and by putting all these things together, we are connecting them. We are giving them context. We are not just having a stream of consciousness or, uh, or like we see on social media these days, where one item often stands um, without being a connection to another but in a portfolio we aggregate things into a one single space where we have a particular purpose in mind and a particular audience so that we can say i created this portfolio for this reason and all the things in that portfolio relate to it and you as viewer can see those relations and i help you through that by either writing text or um, speaking and uploading an audio recording or maybe even a video recording. And so we are showing those relationships between those experiences, but also then engage with others. So in Mahara, I find um, that comes down to five activities for me that we can Abbreviate as five C's because thankfully in English, at least they all start with the same letter, which making it a bit easier to remember all of them. So the first portfolio related activity is the creation of the learning evidence. Of course, typically that kind of happens before you even get to the portfolio. But because Mahara is also an electronic platform where you can create content by just writing text or in, on a normal text blog or in a journal entry, that you can also create content on the platform. Typically, though, that happens outside of it, um, be that as multimedia file or um, text file that you want to upload or um, a video that already sits on social media or on a um, server of your organization. Once we have created that learning evidence, comes the collection so that we put all of those things into Mahara. And at this stage, we are really collecting things and playing hunter and gatherer because right now we are not necessarily deciding which evidence goes onto which page or into a larger portfolio consisting of multiple pages, but we are just collecting things. Once you know, and, and collecting can happen through uploading content, create, again, writing content in Mahara, writing reflections, um, already creating a page that might have a link to an embedded video. And now comes the important activity that distinguishes a portfolio from, say, a pure website. And that is the curation of that evidence, the curation of the learning that, you've, um, that you want to make visible. That is the reflection. Because only through the curation can we make those connections between our learning and what we can see in the learning evidence, as well as between those different artifacts 
and the different activities and learning experiences that we want to make visible. Then we have the possibility to converse with others, inviting them to look at the portfolio, make comments um, either directly in the platform or also invite them to face-to-face -face conversations. Only because we are using a digital platform does not mean that we can't have these face-to-face -face meetings, talk about the portfolio or have a webinar in which we discuss what um, has been seen in a portfolio. Talking to some apprenticeship leaders or also to um, nursing educators, we found that they often encourage those personal conversations before actually a comment is left on the portfolio in order to really make sure that the comment is then also understood and to get a better understanding also from somebody if maybe the evidence or the reflection might not quite make it so clear. And in Mahara, the conversations can be had on the page level or they can also be had on individual artifacts. Therefore, making the comment very specific and when you put a file, for example, that has comments into another portfolio, those comments stay with that file, therefore becoming a permanent record of the portfolio. Lastly, we can also connect with others. So not just through the conversations we have on a portfolio, once a learner decided whether they wanted to share that portfolio with one person, with a group of students, um, or with the entire world, but we can also work in groups and create collaborative portfolios or um, discuss topics in forum discussions. So there are lots of possibilities also to create uh, communities of practice in order to have everything in a platform that can be more social than a lot of learning management platforms are set up. But of course, there can also be an overlap what is being done in the LMS and what is being done on the portfolio side. So if we wanted to look at, well, how can I talk to students about the portfolio and bring that closer to them? You can very well work with metaphors. There are lots of metaphors around that are being used amongst them, for example, the fridge metaphor, how you organize your fridge when you chuck things out, when you put new things in, um, wardrobes have been used, the gardens, and one popular uh, metaphor is the one for the portfolio as a museum or as an art gallery, as Mandy Mentes at Messi University would introduce it, from whom we got that idea to create this visualization. So let's briefly go through that. So if you're looking back at the 5C activities, create, collect, curate, connect, and uh, curate, converse, and connect. Of course, in a museum or art gallery, you don't really create a lot of um, artifacts, so they come before. So we'll start with the collection. And that is happening in our case here in the basement, where museum personnel categorize the artifacts that they get, organize them, move them together where they belong in order to just stay organized. So once they have an exhibition coming up that they can find things. And in Mahara, you can use folders for organization of files. You can set up multiple journals and very importantly, you can use tags on all of them and then find all your content that you have tagged with a specific tag. So like a keyword search in a library catalog or also in a museum. So once the curator is then ready to start the uh, um, exhibit, they would go into that archive and dig up the artifacts that they want to bring up. But that doesn't mean that everything that the museum has will be showing up in the exhibit. There might only be 30, 40 artifacts, but the museum might altogether hold 100 or 200 of them. So they select, they curate the content they have, then put it into the exhibition hall or 
um, multiple halls. And so that we as visitors can make sense of why these particular artifacts are either hanging on the wall or why those uh, sculptures are there or any other displays. They curate them, provide us with information for each artifact, but also often have a summary and a, an explanation of why that exhibition came together. And that is what we can also do in the portfolio. So we have all of that content, all of that learning evidence, then we know what the purpose is for a particular portfolio we are building. And from that lens, then we curate the content, pull it out, put it onto the page, and also make sure that there are reflections there and connecting elements so that a viewer knows what they are getting into. Now, sometimes in a museum, you might have um, part of the, the part of a particular exhibition closed off or an entire wing closed off because there's a special exhibition. In the portfolio world, we can also decide what is publicly freely available and what is closed off and only accessible to a particular group of people or to a particular person. Then once viewers come in, they can go through the portfolio on their own, they can wander through, um, or they can also have conversations either with you as the author of the portfolio or with others that also have access. So they can leave comments um, and can also make audio comments or even upload videos if they liked. So if you think your learners learn better if they have a metaphor available, Think about what metaphor might work best in your case. So if you have um, building apprentices or technology apprentices, what metaphor would work for them so that they have this aha moment and instantly realize what a portfolio is to them, how it can help them and how they can also set it up. With portfolios and portfolio practice, it is always good to also know where to find additional resources, which I've collected here and you have easy access also to, the, uh, to, to them in the shared notes. And um, there, there are of course tons of books been written for the last decades that we've had port um, portfolios in general but also the electronic portfolios. But here I'd like to highlight a few resources that are freely available and therefore accessible to everybody in your community. So one of them is the Designing Effective ePortfolio Activities by my colleague uh, Sam Taylor in the UK. That is a really nice short primer on creating activities for portfolios with a few examples in there that gives you practical advice and suggestions of what you can do and how you can get started. Then earlier I mentioned that portfolios are increasingly used for assessment purposes. And Lisa Donaldson from um, then Dublin City University did a wonderful job compiling two electronic ebooks. The first one, ePortfolio Based Assessment, uh, Inspiring Exploration and Supporting Evaluation for Practitioners, is an ebook where lots and lots of organizations have contributed case studies that are put together, very well written, and don't really look at, or they, they go across also platforms. In those publications, it's often really the focus on the pedagogical element. The second resource only came out a few months ago and is an example uh, and is examples of best practice with ePortfolio based assessment at Dublin City University. Those portfolios often use Mahara as basis because that is DCU's uh, platform of choice. And again, very nice examples compiled that can uh, inspire you on what you might want to try out and also gives you the possibility to contact the um, authors of those case studies if you want to connect with them and find out more. 
Now, since mid-2019, ABLE, the Association of Authentic, Experiential, and Evidence-Based Learning in the United States, that focuses very much its work on ePortfolios, has had a task force on digital ethics in ePortfolios, and there we've created digital ethics principles in order to provide guidance to portfolio practitioners and also researchers on how to incorporate uh, digital ethics principles in their practice in a positive way. I've been a member of the task force since 2019 and we've created uh, so far 13 principles. Currently, we are revising a few and combining them um, because, of course, now after almost two and a half years uh, or two years that we've written them, uh, we, we do see a bit of overlap and therefore want to clarify things. But these principles look at things like uh, practice, um, what can you do for support, evaluation of portfolios, promoting awareness, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization. Very important topics that are coming up more and more in any conversation that we are having. Besides kind of more classical digital ethics topics like respect to author rights and reuse permissions, privacy concerns, accessibility, cross-platform compatibility, content storage and data usage. So very from very tech so we have very technical and practical principles that look at more tools and what you can do and what um, authors can do to also go into more pedagogical and um, principles that look at how to incorporate digital ethics in a classroom. Last but not least, two publications, the Field Guide to ePortfolio and the Learning Portfolio in Higher Education, A Game of Snakes and Letters, are two publications that are also available freely and give a very good insight into um, an overview of what organizations might want to consider when they are starting out with ePortfolios or reviewing their ePortfolio strategy. For that, the field guide provides essentially executive summaries on 12 different topics with a lot of resources for each. And the learning portfolio looks particularly at the learning portfolio, provides resources and also an extensive literature review. So lots of possibilities to get started um, looking into some practical examples and also getting more theoretical ideas and suggestions of what you might want to consider when uh, looking at your portfolio strategy at your organization. Now, if you already have a Mahara instance and you are planning on upgrading that sometime very soon over the Northern Hemispheric summer, I can suggest to come along to tomorrow's webinar on the new features, highlighted features in Mahara 2204 and see what is new there. Or you can, of course, also watch the short seven minute feature video for it. If you have any other questions, happy to chat now, um, or you can also send me an email.